Hey guys, what is up? It's Dusty here. And welcome back to another crypto video. And guys, you know, sometimes when you go to the airport, they just throw your stuff around like there's no tomorrow. I had that today. And I now noticed after already recording a video that my microphone and part of the headset are a little bit messed up. So this is kind of a testing round. I'm not even sure if I can upload this. Maybe the sound is going to be awful. But uh, I guess you guys are going to have to bear with that for a couple of days until I buy a new one then. All right, so the SEC v. Ripple. Here's the good, the bad, and the ugly from the recent court filings. And to be honest with you, you guys really deserve another update as, well, the price is moving interestingly. It was supposed to be a really popular and important week, yet there's nothing really to show for it. So what do we know and what do we have to expect and should expect? Well, we'll talk about that today. The SEC and Ripple have raised the tempo this week, and we look at what has been good for Ripple, the bad, and the outright ugly. The Hinman deposition was undoubtedly the biggest revelation, and while it may have looked like a slam dunk by the SEC, one legal expert found a loophole that Ripple can actually exploit. And so straight to the bat here, it really gets me kind of hyped up. It's quite an interesting article, and I think a lot of you guys are going to pick a couple of points up from this that you're going to be like, oh, really? What? So this week was branded by Legal Minds, we all know who, but all right, as a hell week as far as the security violation lawsuit by the U.S. SEC against Ripple was concerned. And it hasn't disappointed. One motion after another has been filed in court. And while some of them favored Ripple, the SEC came out stronger than many expected and tipped the scales. But it's not over yet for the XP community as we head into the last week of fact discovery. So guys, one thing to really firmly understand right now is that there's about one week left of all of this action. We've actually passed the two important dates already, which are basically the discussions regarding the two most important motions, the emergency motion surrounding Slack communications and the Ripple motion for deliberative process privilege changes, basically. Now, all that had to basically be fixed before the deadline, August 31st. Uh, we still had a little bit of a discussion earlier about whether or not we'll actually see another telephonic hearing or so. But as it currently stands, there's so many new issues that have been brought to light basically because of these two issues. And there's just so much to discuss. I do wonder what will be fixed and done with basically um, before August 31st is reached. Will we come to a conclusion on all of these? Either of these two, or, or which ones do we have to get to a conclusion on? It's quite vague, but we're coming really at a, I guess, at a close point. Now, let's quickly move on here. The Ripple mistake could prove costly. The first battle between the two entities has been for Ripple's Slack communications. Slack, uh, a lot of people didn't understand that. It's actually just an app where you can basically send little small messages, but also... Um, kind of documents and you can kind of put everything in a little small app. It's just kind of a workplace app, right? Is That's the easiest way to put it. Uh, you can also kind of see it as a, as a Facebook group with your friends, but it's more so a workspace app where you can have a little, maybe it's a sort of a little Discord-ish, but then a little bit less social media-like where it's, you know, a lot less people usually. It's more into smaller groups and more, you know, kind of, kind of workplace-y. <laughs> But um, the San Francisco firm filed a motion this week that shed a light on how it plans to defend itself. It described the motion as a costly fishing expedition that would take months and come at a very significant cost. And so right now what's being said is that it's a good defense for Ripple because, well, it's unreasonably duplicative of all these different things they've already shown before. And they've also said, Ripple side, that really picking up all these messages is not going to prove anything new. It's not going to help for, you know, refreshing people's memories. And even if it does, they can't really prove that. And is it worth all those hundreds of thousands and all those months of work that they'd have to spend for it? Can the SEC really prove that it's really going to be worth it? Now, attorney Jeremy Hogan also says that that's a good defense. There's no need to seek Slack messages from not-so-important staffers at Ripple, including people like the receptionist and the interns. 
However, further in his response, he basically says there's a really big mistake because, well, at some point or another, Ripple actually failed to collect all their messages, which was a big blow for them. And so, since this mistake was not discovered until, you know, basically last month, most likely, when there really wasn't such a hurry, uh, there could have been more information given to the SEC a couple of months ago. And because of all of that, the fact that they basically missed out on stuff and right now are trying to use the time argument, Ripple will now have to backpedal and explain to the judge why their discovery company failed to collect such critical information. And there's just not a good answer to that, right? If you have a million messages to seek and you're only finding, for example, 100,000, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big problem, right? And, of course, the judge is not going to be happy with that. So, on that regard as well, there was basically a back and forward and back and forward where the SEC put up their first critical, or I think it's, what what is the official name? Um, emergency, there we go, emergency motion. Then Ripple replied, The oh no, Ripple responded, the SEC replied, and then Ripple filed a surreply. All right, then part two. The SEC cheekily backtracks on access to internal memos. There was this long discussion, all right? April 6th, I believe the first time when the judge in a telephonic hearing said that Ripple should get access to all this information regarding Bitcoin and Ether and whatnot that the SEC had discussed prior. And this week also saw the battle for the SEC's internal memos. Back in April, Judge Sarah Netburn ordered the SEC to produce, among others, intra-agency memoranda or formal position papers discussing Bitcoin, Ether, and XRP. It has been fighting this ever since. By the way, guys, if you are enjoying these daily crypto videos, make sure you press the like button and... Oh, I just slammed my microphone. And if you're looking for a platform to trade, make sure you check out Bybit. It's the exchange that I use. And there's also a world series of trading, a big competition. Make sure you check that out too. So this week, also saw this battle, as we said before, and... Basically, the SEC hasn't really been given anything that they should have, and they've been fighting over this for a very long time right now. However, realizing that Judge Nebron was starting to get pissed off about this, the SEC has backtracked and has done so in a really cheeky fashion. In one of its motions this week, the SEC slid in a critical detail on the footnote, revealing that it was no longer fighting Ripple's access to the internal memos. The SEC determined that no longer asserts DPP over part or of all of the approximately 40 previously withheld documents the watchdog stated so one thing that they basically did is actually instead of hiding everything and keeping everything private they basically admitted to some degree which is odd because if they didn't ripple could kind of fight this hole in one case and you know have a bigger shot at winning and right now they they've tried to make it a little bit more specific by them giving up something which i guess you know if we look at the 48 laws of power it's a really smart strategic move but all right and then the Hinman deposition, we talked about that before. Guys, I have spent so much time reading it, but I'm not able to draw any really crazy conclusions. So what I did basically is there's an entire William Hinman deposition, right? It is 450 pages or almost 500. Oh, it's, they say here 500 plus, but I saw about 480 or something like that. It is, however, only one fourth actually published. I read through every single page of that, of which a lot of pages are obviously blank or I should say, you know, black um, coating, or how do you say it? Highlighter over it, so you can't really read. And, you know, there's a couple conclusions which I could draw, and I might make a video about that, you know, like maybe a five-minute video or so. I'm just kind of going over some of the points I found okay, interesting, but it's more so kind of an SEC-sided document. What I mean with that is that there's a lot of these interesting points, like, for example, about the law firm or about the Ethereum Foundation and whatnot, yet he... William Hinman doesn't give any of the clues that we wanted or so. Like I discussed in the previous time where we uh, went over the William Hinman deposition, there's not really any critical info that we all of a sudden got that's juicy against the SEC. It's mostly just juicy against Ripple, but what is that going to do for us, right? As we know, the SEC is publishing this purely because they want to create some sort of narrative. Now, the um, 90 pages are now available to the public, and out of the 500 plus pages of deposition, it took about nine hours, and even with the 90 pages, a majority of it is redacted. However, for what was available, we learned that Hinman claimed to have told Ripple, you're continuing to offer XRP without any kind of restriction that would apply as a securities offering. If you want to come into compliance, you have to stop doing that, and he understood. Now, the discussion about that one as well, as I've already gone back and forth with a couple of people about that one, is that's the SEC's way of showing the public, hey, you see, 
William Hinman did tell Ripple that they shouldn't continue. Yet, there's a couple of ways to view it. One is, it's just one opinion, right? William Hinman is one guy at the SEC, and if one person says so, it doesn't mean it's fact. Second of all, did he say that with the SEC backing him, or did he say that as an individual? Because that really changed the entire game. If he said it with the SEC backing him, well, that's that has a lot of consequences that it's going to bring with it. If he said it on its own, though, does it matter? And the reason I'm asking you guys that is because the Ethereum speech a couple of years ago, 2018, his own opinion didn't matter, right? And that's literally what he tried to put up here, that his own opinion is not trying to give the market an indication, it's just an opinion. Now, with Ripple, it kind of feels as if it's the same thing. It's not a warning, it's just an opinion piece. And if the SEC is not formally making any statement about it, it's just his opinion, which literally, following his own words, does not matter for anything because... Well, ultimately, it's just a person's opinion. So I do wonder on whether or not we should actually take this in any harsh way. I, I, I don't really think so, as I've just explained, because the SEC obviously is trying to get a certain narrative into our head by releasing all of this and redacting the most important stuff that's incriminating to them. Further down the deposition, Himmon revealed that the first meeting with Ripple was in 2018. However, it wasn't until 2020 that he told the company it was violating security laws. Also vague, right? And in that same year, the SEC sued the company. Of note is that the SEC started investigating Ripple in 2019, a year before the purported Hinman clarification. And then there's another bombshell from Hinman. The former regulator was asked about the SEC's requirement that if any of its officers is going to investigate a company, he can't buy its securities. This is done to ensure that the SEC official remains objective and don't have their judgment and actions clouded by prospects of making some money from their assets. Now, there's right now a back and forth about this one because there's two ways to see this. One is directly buying securities or buying, for example, company stock. Uh, but there's also, of course, the, the idea of if you're buying crypto and you're ruling on crypto, that's bad. But if you're working for a company that's heavily involved in crypto, which gives you bonuses because of those said crypto, you know, how that ball rolls around. And that's also specifically right now why there's a investigation into William Hinman and all those guys because it's strange. So Ripple's legal team asked him, am I correct that digital assets were not covered by this clearance form until 2018? And Hinman's lawyer stepped up and protected him from answering the question. However, as attorney Jeremy Hogan observes, it's very clear that the Ripple legal team already knew the answer to the question. That answer is that the SEC didn't consider digital assets as securities for its ethics purposes until 2018. And that bodes very well for Ripple as far as its fairness defense for the period from 2013 to 2018 is concerned. And I, I really agree with that too. I've thought about it for a little while and I really firmly agree with that, guys. Because think about it. If the SEC, for their own purchasing laws to make everything fair, didn't consider it a security until a couple of years after you were doing your sales and doing your, your, you know, your, your sailing, selling whatever... Well, then it really serves as a fair argument as to how you couldn't have known that they were securities. If even the SEC didn't classify them for their own members, right? And not even supposedly, not even as options like potential or a couple handpicked ones instead of an entire rule. No, they didn't pick any crypto as securities back then. So I'm going to say that's a really, really bullish thing. I think that's really, really nice. And guys, as I just explained, the coming week could also prove to be critical in the case. It'll be the last week before the fact discovery deadline on October 1st. Um, that's not the, that's not the fact discovery deadline he, he means. It's actually the, <laughs> he, he got the article so right. All right. And then on his last line, he messes up a little bit. So we're, we have two different deadlines. You have the fact discovery deadline and the expert discovery deadline. And we're talking about the fact discovery deadline that is right now. I'm not exactly sure why he put this October for, uh, Yeah. I'm not exactly sure why you put that up right there, unless I'm stupid. If I am, guys, please let me know in the comment section down below. I will definitely accept it with open arms. I will write an apology letter to the individual who wrote this. <laughs> uh, but as it currently stands, I think he meant August 31st and accidentally put that on October 1st. Uh, once more, please correct me. Please, please, please correct me if I am wrong. So, uh, point being, this week, the next seven days, I think, or eight days, are most critical it is the last week before the deadline, and we do wonder what issues will be closed, right? Will the judge rule on the emergency motion? Will she rule on the deliberative process privilege motion? Will she rule on John Deaton's motion to intervene? 
Uh, will she rule on any of this other stuff, right? Will we get another telephonic conference? What will we get? This week is about to be really important and really big, guys. So watch it carefully, watch it closely, and stay hyped up, all right? We're making money, guys. We're making money. Things are looking good. Oh, things are looking good.